Is there any, any good reason why we have a smaller crowd today other than the material started getting more in last class? Is there any other reason? Or should we plow on a little bit? Let's, um, let's get started with, uh, first of all, any questions or comments about anything happening in the world, okay, that, uh, that, that, that we can talk about? Okay, I guess, uh, uh, I guess the interesting news here uh, economically was that there was a run on a bank yesterday, you know, um, today, you know, yes, yesterday here in Hong Kong. Um, and um, one reason, so, so what it, reason why people make runs on banks, just a quick, a quick thing, is because banks take money as deposits and they loan it out to people. And you're very happy leaving your money in the bank so long as you're convinced the bank will pay you will pay you back. But if you're afraid that the bank will not have the money for it, then suddenly you get very nervous and you run to the bank. Okay? And this usually gives banks a very difficult time. Because in principle they take your money and loan it out to other people. If everybody needs the money all at once, any bank will crumble because you don't have, you know, all, you know, you don't in some sense have ready access to all your money immediately, okay? But, um, you know, usually either the bank has to borrow something or have to convince their customers that there's not a problem with the bank, okay? Any questions? In the United States, one reason you don't have bank runs so much is because there is a insurance, there's sort of a, a, a form of banking insurance that the government offers called the FDIC, where every bank, um, you know, somehow every, let's say, reasonable bank, okay, or reputable bank, Okay, we'll buy this sort of insurance, and then all the accounts are are um, you know are guaranteed for all its holders up to like a hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Do they have a form of insurance here for the bank? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a reputable a bank in an insurance program like that, you shouldn't worry too much about bank runs. Okay, but that's seemingly the interesting thing that happened. If you want to know more about bank runs. I strongly recommend um, watching um, a movie, okay? And the movie is called It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this. Okay, I, I won't quite make it homework, but try to find this movie, and it'll teach you all you need to know about bank runs and a lot more about the United States. Any questions? Any questions about bank runs or international news or anything like that? Okay, one other question. You had a question, okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking there are so many models to predict the value of options, but it seems there are less models to predict the actual stock value. Okay, so the concern that he had today was we, we learned something about models for predicting options, and we haven't yet really come up with models for predicting options. We've come up with bounds as to what the prices should be, okay? Um, you're sort of saying a couple things. One is, why aren't there bounds on what um, what stock prices should be? Okay, that might be one thing you're saying. And there are sort of some theories of bounds as to what a price should be. As an example for a stock, there's things called price earnings ratios. Okay, that usually, since as, as you own a stock, you own a fraction of its of its profits. You would normally expect that a stock that is, um, you know, a mature, well understood stock should trade at a reasonable multiple of its earnings. You know, if I wanted to figure out how much should I pay you, if I, if I could buy you and own you, okay, what would be the right price for you, okay? It's a function of how much will you earn over the course of your, your lifetime, right? And. Um, you, you know, if you think about owning a stock, it's a function of how much is it actually earning, okay? And so there are, are bounds that say stocks should trade within ranges related to that. But that doesn't work very well for startup stocks, which may have very little earnings. And so let's say that that's complicated. That's one reason why we're going to get into issues uh, related to random walks and things like that that we're going to start talking about today. Okay, let's just leave it at that. Any questions? Any other questions about what we were talking about? Last class we were talking about um, bounds on option prices. Um, I'd like to, but we found that options prices, like everything else in the world, depend upon interest rates. So today I'd like to talk about 
Two things. One, I'd like to go through a little bit more. We've talked about, in, in, in some vague sense, about the interest rate. And we know that there is this variable R that denotes the interest rate. Okay? And um, interest rates are somewhat more complicated than just that. Okay? But I want, to, I want to provide a little bit of background about interest rates and how they work. Before getting into um, the first, let's say, technique we might have for really pricing options, which would start to get into random walk models and things like that. Um, so, okay, so what do we know about interest rates? Everything we have talked about in this course so far has pretty much assumed that there is a risk-free interest rate R, okay? And this is some fundamental return, okay, that uh, you, get, you, you can get for, for money without fear of losing the money, okay? In principle, if you take the money and stuff it under your mattress, okay, or, you know, you lock it in a, in a bank vault, okay, it is risk-free, okay, you know, barring the, the uh, you know, the, the, the place being nuked, okay, and the money physically disappearing. But, um, but that doesn't earn any interest, okay? Um, there is, are ways to earn a certain amount of return risk-free, okay? And that's by depositing in banks and governments that are so safe that people do not fear they're imploding, okay? Now, when we talk about interest rates, we should be clear that there are many different interest rates to different people, okay? And that they depend upon different factors, what the actual real interest rate you can get is. One of them depends upon the national currency, okay? We saw that in certain countries, um, you know, depending upon how stable the currency is, since there, an interest is being paid in that currency, depending upon how much people want to have it or not have it, okay, um, interest rates will be different. Um, the duration of the loan, if you're, let's say, borrowing money or depositing money, you will get different amounts of money, a, a different interest rate, depending upon how long you leave the money in there, okay? If you'll commit to giving them the money for 30 years, that will command a higher interest rate than if you let them hold the money till tomorrow, okay, usually, okay? And so the duration of the loan makes a difference factor in what kind of an interest rate you can get. The credit worthiness of the borrower makes a difference, okay? It should be clear that uh, I am happier to loan money to the United States government than I am to, um, you know, let, let, let's say you, okay? Why is that? Well, the U.S. government can print its own money. The U.S. government uh, has never missed a payment. You, I don't know if you've ever missed a payment. But, but there's a principle and notion here of different borrowers have diff you know, different amounts of reliability for being able to pay back. And you would expect that if I'm loaning money to someone who I am less sure is going to return it, if I have a choice of returning, loaning it to someone who's highly reliable, or somebody who's suspicious, I would prefer to loan it to someone who's highly reliable. And that would mean that the suspicious guy, in order to get money, has got to pay a higher interest rate. And I think this has got to be obvious here. Okay? The backing collateral provided. Okay? I am actually perfectly happy to loan you, okay, um, money, okay, provided you give me access to something that is worth more money than I am loaning to you. So let's say that you own a house, okay, and you want to borrow $100 from me, and we have an agreement that I get to keep the house if you don't pay me back. Then I'm quite happy to deem you as trustworthy, okay, because even if you're not trustworthy, I get the house and that's worth more than $100 to begin with, okay? So interest rates would depend upon what kind of backing is being provided, okay? And finally, there's also, interest rates also depend upon the intended use of the money, okay? In the United States, for example, it's, it's easier to get, let's say you're gonna go come to me and say, I'm gonna get, I wanna borrow money from you, okay? And I'd like to invest it in a house, okay? A house is a nice physical thing that I know I can take it, take um, back at the end of the day if you didn't, um, you know, if, 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 you, if, if you don't pay me. If you tell me you're gonna go take it and invest it at the racetrack, okay? 
then I am probably going to demand a higher level of interest because I'm going to feel less likely that I'm going to get A. Or in the case of certain loans, okay, there may be government subsidies for certain kinds of uses of money that wouldn't be there for other ones. Okay? So all of these factors affect what is the interest rate that somebody will get at some point where they need money. And this is one reason why interest rates is a complicated business. And banks are complicated businesses. Any questions? Okay? So all those factors should be clear. Now what do we mean by the risk-free rate? Okay? We would like that a lot of our arguments have been subject to the fact that there is a, a somewhere underlying this a risk-free valuation. Um, one measure of risk-free rate is what we would call the um, interest rates that are earned on loans to the government in its own currency. Now, why is this an interesting measure as a loan to a government in its own currency? If as a government has the property of printing money, then in principle a government can always pay you back whatever you borrow from it, right? If you borrow a billion dollars from the U.S. government and everything goes belly up, so long as there exists a printing press still working, okay, the government will be able to pay you back its money, okay? So that is one reason why, in some sense, loans to the government are risk-free. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Now, um, that still means that some people will want to make loans to some governments, but not other governments. Okay? And so the interest rates will vary. Okay? But, so when we hear about treasury rates, these are the, the, the rates that the government is getting when it borrows money from people, from, from, from banks, from different organizations. Any questions about that? Okay? And typically the way that it, 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 it borrows money, okay, the government does not typically go to the bank and say, here, give me money for a car, okay? What it will do instead is sell bonds or, or bills, okay, on a regular basis, maybe every week, depending upon what its interests or its needs are, okay? And these things are typically sold at auctions, okay? So, the, so people who want these securities can buy them. Okay, and they somehow set the, the, the price, the current price by supply and demand. Any questions? So that's a gross sense of what treasury rates are. Now, there is another more commonly used proxy for what we will call um, risk-free rates, which is what we call the London Interbank Offered Rate, the LIBOR rate. Okay? And what is this? Okay? Banks, there, there exist in this world large banks. Governments we know can pay you back because they print money. Big banks, in principle, can pay you back, back because they're big banks. They're reliable, safe institutions. Okay? And banks often have needs to make loans or to, to either make loans or deposits with each other. Let's think about it. If you deposit money into the bank now, Okay, let's say, let's say I am now a bank, okay, and I have suddenly, you walk in and you make me a donation, a, a, a loan, a, a deposit of a billion dollars. I've got to do something with this money now. I can put it in my safe, or I can loan it to somebody else till I, you know, and if people come by and want to borrow from me, that's fine, I'll eventually write them loans and housing loans and things like that. But now, until I get somebody to use that money, I want to earn some interest in it. So quite likely what I will do with my extra money, this, te this temporary overflow, is deposit it at another bank. And so all the big banks quite often will have extra funds that they need to deposit for brief periods of time elsewhere. Or they might have needs for sudden money. Again, yesterday there was this bank run on this local bank. Undoubtedly, when the line started forming, okay, the guy who worked at the bank first said, wow, that advertising campaign was very effective. You've got so much more business. And then the next thing he realized was, no, everybody's trying to take money out. We need money quickly. He undoubtedly went and borrowed it from another bank to make sure that he could meet the immediate demands. Okay? So banks will clearly borrow, and borrow from each other and loan to each other. 
And the rate at which good banks, large double A rated banks, okay, can borrow and borrow currently borrow and loan money to each other at is the LIBOR rate. Okay? And this is considered to be another um, proxy to sort of this idea of the risk-free rate. Okay? And in principle, it may it's probably a better proxy because the kind of derivative things derivative traders are doing, more likely it revolves around people borrowing money from banks and giving money to banks than it is to the government. Okay? Especially because the LIBOR rate tends to be a higher rate than the Treasury rate. Any questions about these, these, these notions? Okay? Okay? Any questions? When people talk about interest rates, one thing that, that comes that, that is um, an important concept is, is what they call the yield curve. Okay? At this given instant moment, if I want to borrow money, okay, <coughs> we said that the amount of the interest rate that I will get will depend somewhat upon how, how long I am borrowing the money for. When is it that I commit to paying it back? Okay? In general, what we would expect when we look at interest rates is something sort of like this. That this is, again, you can't really read this, but this probably says one month, three months, a year, 30 years. You would expect, and this is going to be the interest rate itself, you would expect that as the maturity time to bar, take the loan for, okay, increases, the rate at which you're going to get for it increases. Why would we expect interest rates to increase with maturity? One reason is there's a question of risk, okay? Maybe I'm willing to loan you money now because you look like a reputable person. But if I loan it to you for 30 years, you have a lot of times to get into bad habits. You have a lot of time to have bad things happen to you. So the longer I borrow money for, the more risk I have that something bad is going to happen in the interim, right? I'm pretty sure Google is not going to go out of business in the next six months. Do you want to bet that Google's in business 30 years from now? Well, I think you'll bet. You think, yeah, I think Google will be in business 30 years from now. But 30 years ago, I guarantee you bet that Lehman was going to be in business <laughs> at this point too, right? Long time horizons makes it harder to judge risk. That should be clear, right? It's also when you think about making a deposit to the bank. If you make a deposit to the bank for 30 years, okay? It's clearly an inconvenience to you. You can't use the money before that. Okay? If I'm making a loan to the bank for 30 years, it means basically I'm either giving the money to my grandchildren, okay, or something like that, right? So we would expect that under normal conditions, you would expect, let me you push this down. Under normal conditions, you would expect that, um, that, that the yield curve would be increasing, okay? Sometimes when there are weird economic conditions, okay, let's say what would happen if, if yield curves weren't increasing. If you could get more, a higher interest rate for loaning the, bank to, the money to the bank for a month than for 30 years, what would you do? Okay, if you had some money to deposit. Put it for one month and then roll it for the next month and then roll it for the next month. If we were always guaranteed that we could make a loan, to the, we could make a deposit for the bank, get a higher interest on a one-month deposit than on a 30-year deposit, it would be insane okay, to make a 30-year deposit. Does that make sense? However, if you make a one-month deposit, there's no guarantee interest rates won't change. Okay? And usually it's only in very rare times, times of, of, of certain kinds of economic stress, that short-term rates will be higher than, um, than, than long-term rate, long rates. So occasionally you hear in the news about inverted yield curves. That means that's when these rare situations exist, where people are more, more interested in borrowing money for short-term than for long-term. Okay? or when, 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 when interest rates for short term are higher than for long term. 
Okay? Any questions? But usually it's fair to say that we expect it to decrease with time. Any questions about yield curves? Anything like that? So to give you an example of a yield curve and how it changes here, okay, this is, again, I don't know if you can read it from where you are. I took um, the daily prices on U.S. Treasury yields. The, 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 the yield curve on U.S. Treasuries for every day over the, you know, like the first 15 days of the month, okay? And I don't know if you can read it from there, but what's, what's kind of interesting here? Let me read it to you. So first of all, when it comes to U.S. Treasuries, it has to do with the yield. The U.S. Treasury Department buys and sells bonds of fixed durations. Okay, so they're sort of standard units of loans, so sort of st standard term lengths that are offered. One month, three months, six months, one year, three years, two years, three years, five years, seven years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years. And if you look at, let's say, on September 2nd, the rates went from 1.6%, okay, 1 1.72%, 1.93%, 2.1%, 2.2%, 2.5%, 3.3%, 3.7%, 4.3%, 4.36%, 4 okay? In general, as we suspect, that as the maturity date gets longer, okay, the, um, you know, what you call it, the, the interest rate gets higher, okay? The other thing to note here is that this rate fluctuates every day. If you looked at every column, this is sort of showing the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. Every business day, each one of these rates fluctuates. Okay? Now, why is that? One reason might be that you think every day the U.S. government goes and tries to sell more of these. And this is the rate that it got for those bonds today. But the other thing is that because these bonds are traded on the market, the U.S. Department government will sell some of these bonds when it needs money. But once you have, let's say, a 30-year U.S. Treasury bond, you can put it in, 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 you know, under your mattress and wait for 30 years and get paid. Or you can sell it to somebody else. Does that make sense? Okay. And a lot of, let's say, the market in U.S. Treasuries is not between the U.S. government and people who want to loan it money, but people who are trading back and forth these loans, these bonds, okay? That's what the bond market is, okay? And the bond price market now reacts very heavily to supply and demand every day because there's this busy, this busy bond market trading back and forth U.S. Treasury bonds. And the value of a bond when it's sold can be mapped back to the interest, okay, that it's going to earn. Okay, and so somehow you can impute, compute what the interest rate is on one of these bonds based on what the bonds are actually trading for, okay? This is, um, I don't want to get into detail here, okay? But basically there is a bond market that somehow fixes you can convert the price that a 30-year bond for $10,000 returning $10,000 in, um, you know, in, in 20, 2003 is, okay, to, um, you know, to, 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 to a current interest rate now, okay? And that's what this is showing. And what was very interesting about interest rates here, if you look at, let's say, the bond prices, this was one of the most interesting things in the crisis, the one-month bond interest rate went from 1.6%, 1.5%, 1.5%. When the big credit problem happened, here it was, went down from 1.3, 0 0.036, 0 0.023, 0 0.07, okay, interest percent interest rate, okay, almost nothing, okay before going up the next day to 0.26. What happened here? When this whole big crisis happened, okay, and people were wondering if the stock market was coming to an end or something like that. Everybody wanted to go into a risk-free thing. In principle, a risk-free thing was something that was issued by the government, okay? And so everybody started buying these treasury bonds. 
and the price of them because everybody wanted to buy them was that to get me to sell them you've got to pay more and more to get me to sell my treasury bond to you okay and finally I will sell it to you okay only if you're giving me so much money that really the interest that you're earning on the remainder okay is very very low okay so what ended up happening was that for a short periods of time okay the US Treasury rate was ridiculously low okay but long-term maturities hardly changed okay what was happening today in the bond market and today's sudden need for cash shouldn't affect my my interest in taking this loan for 30 years okay and those interest rates were more stable any questions about this okay any questions I can just uh, say this once and I think I was being too 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 vague here again I think we talked about this when we were talking about interest rates suppose let's say that I have a um, a bond that will pay, um, you know, return me that, that, that I put in a thousand dollars today and it's going to be earning rate, earning at let's say five percent. Okay? That's somehow what the bond, over for 30 years, right? If the interest rate now goes up to 10 percent, okay? Is this bond worth more or less than it was before? Less, okay? Because this thing is paying off at 5%. It is going to pay off 30 years from now in, let's say, uh, $3,010 you know, $3, 30 years from now, right? But now, what is the present value of something that is going to be worth this much then. The present value of it is much less, right? And so the price of this bond should drop, okay, it accordingly, okay? So when you look at what a bond is paying, so now if I take a look at it, this thing, if I can buy this thing today for a price of, let's say, $762, and it's going to be um, worth this much then, I can figure out what is the interest rate that multiplying this, 1 plus r to the 30, is going to equal that, right? And this is the implicit interest rate based on the price of that bond sale. Okay, now I think this is clear. Okay, does that make sense? If it doesn't, please ask. And so what happened was, there was this bond during the crisis that was um, started out at $1,000, paying 5%, let's say. Going to be worth this in 30 years. Suddenly everyone decided they had to have this. They desperately had to have this. If they paid $3,000 for it today, what would be the interest rate? that would make it be worth that target. This would be worth, the implicit interest rate is now very low. Does everybody see that? So that's really what happened. That's why the interest rates suddenly seemed to be very low. Now no one was doing this on 30 year bonds because everyone figured this will blow over. But doing something like this on a, on a one month bond is what happened in the market there. Any questions? Any questions about seeing how bond prices relate to the interest rates, which relate implicitly to what people will loan to the government for? Any questions? And again, these were showing, I took, did a little bit of uh, a look at what the LIBOR rates, the interbank rates were, okay? And um, here, the LIBOR rates for like one month, for the bonds we were looking at were in the neighborhood of... Um, like 1.6% before things started going bad. Okay, for the interbank rate, it was about 2.5% before things started going bad. And then when the bank started seemingly getting into trouble, everyone was holding on to their money. The interbank rate went up very high, like 6% or something like that. At the same time, the U.S. Treasury rate was seemingly down to almost nothing. Any questions?
Any questions about how these bank rates work and what these notions of, um, of risk-free rates mean? Yes? I don't understand why it will be so high, like 6%. Well, why was it that, so, so let's picture this world. We saw that the U.S., that this rate was governed by what are people willing to pay for treasury bills at that time, right? There was a supply and demand issue with, supply, with treasury bills. And at that, the peak of the crisis, everybody wanted the safety of the U.S. Treasury bills. They thought the world was going to collapse. And if they paid enough for those Treasury bills, the yield and the effective interest rate was low. Now let's go to the banks at this time. The banks desperately needed money um, among themselves. They were having, somehow because of the, the, the current conditions, they were afraid of bank loans. Let's think of it this way where people were going to start withdrawing money from them. They had to have money in order to withdraw it. The best place for them to get the money is by borrowing it from another bank. But if all the banks are having the same problems now, nobody wants to lend it to them. So the only way that they will, someone will lend you the money overnight, or, or quickly, or short term, is if you pay them enough for it. If you give me a high enough interest rate, I will loan you the money. Okay? And what happened was because there was this unusual need within the banks for the money, that rate went up. Any questions? Yeah. If, uh, because uh, the, the bond can be traded in the market. Yeah. Uh, so if, if I buy a 30 years bonds and then uh, maybe after two years I, I want money and then I sell it, then I can, I, I, is that always I can earn more interest than I just buy two years bonds? Okay, well, so there's a question of whether or not, the question is, how is the bond worth something as time goes by if I hold it for a while? Is a used bond less attractive than a new, new bond, is what you're sort of asking, okay? And this gets into issues of certain bonds may have made you payments along the way. If so, then that money went to you and not to the person who's going to buy the bond. And so it depends whether they're paying you at the end or intermediately. Okay. Okay. And different bonds, there's different, there's different kinds of notions of bonds. Unless I don't want to get into the details of these. But there's questions. You hear people mumble things like, is it a zero coupon bond? Or what kind of a bond is it? This gets into the issue of, is it making off payments along the way? Or is it going to save up everything and just give it to you in a lump sum at the end? Okay. And it should be agree agreeable that that bit should make a change in the value. Right? The important thing is that each bond has an issue date, and an expiration date, and a value. And the person who's buying it knows what these parameters are and prices it accordingly. Okay, because they come in these standard denominations. Any questions? And therefore they can be traded on exchanges and things like that. Any questions? Okay. Now, one issue that we haven't talked about it here at all, okay, has been things like having things related to balance sheets, okay? If I try and decide if one person is more credit worthy than another person, look at I'm loaning to a company. If I want to loan to a company, I need to decide something about how secure that company is, okay? How good its business, how likely is that company going to be to pay off? And here is where, what I would say, a lot of the messy accounting kinds of things we're not going to talk about come into the finance picture. In principle, somebody from the business school, will say, grows up, becomes an accountant, okay, should be able to take a look at a business's financial records and say something to the effect of how likely is it, how much is it, debt does it have, how much cash does it have, how secure are we? Would we be give, loaning this person more money, this company more money? And so, to abstract away all the details of balance sheets and financial issues of companies from our consideration, there is this notion of a credit rating. What is a credit rating? A credit rating is a score issued by some agency some company, some, some entity, about some other entity 
Okay, measuring the strength of its reliability to pay back debt. Okay? So, if you want to start your own credit rating agency, this is fine. In fact, we want we can start the Skeena Credit Rating Agency that will assign scores to every bond or every company in the world how reliable it is. Okay? Now, you probably wouldn't trust the Skeena Credit Agency very much, or you shouldn't. Okay? But there are certain companies or certain organizations that have built reputable businesses by analyzing other companies' stock, analyzing other companies' securities, analyzing other companies' banknotes and countries and, and balance sheets and things like that, so that they can assign a rating score to it. Okay? And so there are standard rating scores that reflect how much how reliable a bond is, how likely it is that the agency will be able to pay it back, okay? And clearly that should have an impact on its value, right? Okay? So the two main rating agencies are these Standard and Poor's and Moody's, and they give ratings that are sort of the same, but they, you know, they, they, they change a little bit the letters. Standard and Poor's says best is AAA, it goes down to AA, A, B, 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 C, 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 and so on. Moody's does AAA, but they, they capitalize it differently. And instead of C's, it becomes CAA, whatever. Okay, but I think you get the basic sense that the letter grades, just like the letter grades I will award you, okay, go from A to something lower. Same thing is true with these credit rating agencies. Okay, any questions? And the argument is, that somehow these things are made by smart people who have looked at a balance sheet and can safely look at a loan and a, a bond, look at the current balance sheet of a company, and reduce it to a probability that you will be paid, okay, as reflected by a credit agent rating, okay? Any questions? Yes? So who pays for this uh, credit rating agency? Who pays for the credit rating agency? That's a good question. I believe that the credit rating agency is paid by the issuer of the bond, okay? So if let's say I'm going to try to sell bonds, you know, in, in Digiscam, I start my company, okay? You are probably going to be more likely to want to buy it if it was rated by a credit agency, okay? So I will probably pay, a, I, I believe that the way it usually works is that I will go to the, uh, an agency and say, pay them to rate it, okay? An alternate model might be, of course, that people are very interested in learning credit rating, ra 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 ratings, okay? And that they pay the company itself for the ratings, okay? If you're going to be want to buy bonds, you're going to want to know what are my latest ratings. And maybe I'll get paid by you subscribing to my database. That's probably a better model if you want to have a fair, you know, sort of unbiased thing. Okay? And frankly, I don't know which model really is the one that is in place at these agencies. Does anybody know? Okay? So, I mean, either model could be economically make sense, right? And, um, you know, I, I frankly, I'll admit I don't know which is which. Okay? Any questions? Okay? But what's interesting about it is that once you've got, from our point of view of being, you know, computer-like quant people, we don't want to look at balance sheets because that's complicated and messy and uh, analog and we don't do it, okay? But now, once we have bond ratings, bond ratings map to probabilities, okay? So here is a historical thing, at maybe over a 20-year period, okay? Which is showing on the x-axis, th this, this column shows the, the bond rating. The other thing shows what is the probability Okay, the percentage of these bonds that defaulted within a certain number of years. So if you have an AA, a triple A bond, none of them defaulted historically within one year, okay, of the issuance of the rating. Okay? As you move down through the ratings, you'll see that um, that, that the probability of default in one year increases. If you have a company that is rated CCC, you know, in the, in the C's, 
there's a 19% chance, almost 20% chance, it will default within a year. Okay? That is a risky, riskier business, right? Does that mean you should not loan money to them? No. It means that if you do loan money to them, you'd either better get some kind of collateral or a very high enough interest rate to justify this risk. Does that make sense? And you can look also at how this plays out multiple years from now. If you looked at this historical data, a, a AAA rated company, it looks like half of 1% of them default within 10 years. So even AAA, there is a certain level of risk, but it's a lot lower. Does everybody see that? If you look at the difference between, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, in, in, in 10 year default rates, there is a fairly sharp lot difference between the A rated things and the B rated things. That's why if you want your, you know, if you want something to be secure, you may always want to invest in, let's say, an AA or something like that bond. Okay, and that's much more secure than otherwise. Any questions? Okay? So clearly if you're issuing a debt, you're going to want to have as good a credit rating as possible. If you're buying uh, a loan from someone, you want as accurate a rating as possible. Okay, so you know what you're actually paying for. Any questions about that? So, these credit ratings are actually interesting things. Okay, because they start to get us, if you want to model, let's say, what happens to debt over the course of um, an existence of a life. We can start to model that through something called the Markov model, okay? We can start to think about probabilistic models of what is the likelihood that a, a loan is going to be defaulted on, okay? A Markov model is a network of states, okay, where there is a probability of transition between every pair of states. Okay? And what makes a Markov model somehow a Markov model is the idea that the probability of being in a, a state at a particular time is a function totally only of what was the probability you were in a state at a, each state at a, the previous time step and this transition probability. Markov models are things that don't have memory in some sense. Right? Or they have very, very restricted memory. Okay? The, the, that, that if I want to figure out what is the probability that, let's say, at this particular time, I have, my bond is going to be AA rated. At time T minus 1, it was in, this bond could have been in any of one of a number of other states. Right? And if we know the probability distribution of what the probability is I was in each one of these states, and the probability that I would transition from this state to that state as per this sort of network. I can figure out what is the probability that I will be in graded AAA, AA at time T. Okay? Any questions about what I said? I don't know if that's a little nebulous or not. Maybe it's familiar, hopefully it's familiar to people, you know, from taking probability courses. But we can use the state somehow to remember something about the history. So this will remember what was the history, what state were we in one time unit ago. It doesn't remember what was the whole path that took us there. Just what state we were in at that time. Okay? Any questions? So what's neat about that now is if we can figure out the transition matrix from historical data, let's say, showing us what was the probability that in the course of one year we went from this state to that state, we can now build some kind of a model to trace through what the evolution of our credit rating is likely to be. Okay? Let's say that we start out with a BBB rate, BAA rating, almost with a probability of 0.8. A year from now, we will still have that rating. 
right? There's a 6.5% chance we'll slip to a BAA rating. A 6% chance we will go up to an A rating. A 0 0.08 chance we will suddenly jump to B, triple A, right? So, I don't know, I guess, wait, uh, from this, right, 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 right. I, I was reading it right. So it's from here to that. So what we could now do is, in some sense, build a model if you want to figure out what is likely to happen to the rating of my bonds, okay, you could use a matrix like this to model what is the likelihood that I will get paid a certain number of years from now, and what is the likelihood of the probability distribution of my um, credit of my the bond rating over time, because the value of my bond is going to depend upon what the rating is. Does that make sense? So we can now start to think about random models for using randomness, okay, or, or, or somehow analyzing this chain of probabilities to figure out what is the distribution of, what is the probability that a bond rated here now will be rated between AA and, and BAA three to four years from now. All of that is implicitly given by this matrix, okay, if you assume that there's sort of a, uh, um, uh, a Monte Carlo model, a, a, you know, a, a Markov model underlying it. Yes? So a Markov model is good enough for this? Like, is it true that the history is not important, just the new history? So the argument here would be that the history doesn't really matter, okay? So if, if, we, if we're assuming a Markov model here, we are implicitly saying that the rating of the company, okay, is a function of its current state and not the state that it took to get there, right? If we imagine we have a Arrhythmia Corporation whose rating goes up and down like this, okay? Implicit in the Markov model is the idea that, that, that all we need to know about its credit rating is its current um, all, all, all we need to know about the, um, the company is its current rating, okay? And the argument, I guess, is that if the credit rating agency is doing its job, it knows about Arrhythmia's history, okay? Does that make sense? So in some sense, if you think about it, is, if, if the credit rating agency had this information at its disposal at the time that it gave that, um, that rating, so if the rating agency did its job and assigned the probabilities accordingly, the Markov model seems reasonable. Okay? Any questions? You know, it's a question of something if measuring your current health, okay, is enough to reflect what your likelihood of living further is. That maybe is sort of the question that you're asking about now, right? If we imagine there's a, a graph here, where you go from sort of a uh, superhero to dead, okay? Every person is going to have a certain level of health, right? And in general, your trajectory should be something like, well, you're a baby, you're probably, you know, reasonably, maybe high variance when you're a baby, you get sick a lot, okay? But then as you get older, you're usually pretty healthy, and then it slowly goes off, and then eventually you die, right? You, if I want to now take a look at this point in time here, perhaps there's somebody who alternately goes through periods of taking lots of drugs recreationally and working out a lot. Okay, that's right now what you're arguing about, right? And let's say now you're at this current state of health, right? Can we predict your, your trajectory as well? Do we need to know this variance, okay, to predict that? The answer is, if I guess in the health model, probably knowing the variance is helpful, okay, or at least it's interesting. But on the other hand, most people's trajectories don't look like that. Most people's trajectories are probably pretty uniform, okay. And so the question of how how important history is is you know something that that one has to think about, okay.
Bottom line, in a Markov model, is simple. It ignores that history. And for a lot of things, that's good enough. Okay? If you don't believe it's good enough, you might want to use a kth order Markov model, where you maintain the state from the previous k years implicit in the process. Those are somewhat harder to work with, but again, the same kind of an idea could work. Any questions? And one thing, just as a, a comment here, we, the credit crunch that we've been talking about, one of the big problems is the cause of all, let's say, all this financial stuff that's going on is that there were a lot of bonds that rating agencies apparently rated too highly. So you had a rating agency you have trusted for years, and they're telling you this bond is a double-A bond. In fact, they didn't understand the bond very well, and it was really a B bond, okay? Then, in fact, it's going to fail much more often than an A bond should, okay? And if you've made planning based on these ratings, suddenly you're in for surprises. <clears throat> and that's what the source of a lot of the problem in the current crisis is. Any questions about that? But for our purposes, because we don't want to deal with balance sheets, credit ratings are a nice thing to deal with. Any questions? Now, if we want to picture the default probabilities, let's say I own a bunch of different shares of a company. Uh, I own stock, let's say bonds from a bunch of different companies. Okay? Let's say all these companies are um, rated, let, let's go back, let's say I own a bunch of, of, of companies rated C. Okay? Let's, let's go back, the horrible ones. Okay? Within a year, it said 19% of them fail. Okay? My question is this. If I own a lot of, of different companies like this, would I expect that on average 19% 19 of them would probably fail? Or is there going to be a lot of variance in that? Well, let's think about it a little differently. If I had coins, let's say that instead of grade C bonds, let's talk about grade Z bonds, which are ones that fail with a probability of one half after each year. Okay? They're like coin flips, right? If I have a hundred different coins that I'm flipping, and I will get a, a you know, I will keep my, my penny if it's, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, comes up heads and I lose it if it goes tails. If I flip a hundred coins, how many of coins will be heads? Not exactly, some say 50. The answer is not exactly 50, but about 50, right? And 50 with a great deal of reliability, about 50 with a great deal of reliability. If I had all of them come up tails, what did I know? I know that someone was cheating, right? I don't know that was happening by chance. The variance inherent, because I'm dealing with a hundred independent coin flips is such that the expectation, okay, the expected number of events, okay, is probably a good predictor of what's going to actually happen. Does that make sense? Now, suppose, let's say, I had bought risky companies now, okay? Is it the case that every year I could, and if I did this experiment year after year, the same thing would happen? Half, the, half of the coins would come up heads, half of the coins would come up tails. Sometimes it's 45, sometimes it's 47, sometimes it's 53. But if I were holding companies here, is the default probability, the expected number of defaults that I would have if I had 100 different companies? going to be constant year to year? The answer is no. Why is that? Well, for one thing, there are conditions. Okay, right? There are economic conditions. This is a bad time to be a company, right? There's going to be a lot more defaults this year than there were three years ago, right? So the one thing that makes these bond things kind of tricky is that 
the probability of failure of, let's say, two AA rated companies over the years is not an independent thing. Okay? If I bought a portfolio of coins that I was going to, or, or, you know, numbers on a roulette wheel, okay, those are independent. And I can predict them and treat them as independent to predict what's going to actually happen. Note that that is not going to be true, okay, when it comes to financial assets here. Okay? If I deal with a portfolio, there are going to be correlations due to economic conditions, due to similar markets, right? And this is what complicates, another factor that complicates dealing with these kind of portfolios of bonds and things like that. Okay? I, can't tr I can predict reliably what the probability is of it going bankrupt or not one of them. But the variance among them, okay, is something that deals a lot with uh, economic conditions. Any questions? Okay. The last thing I want to say about interest rates, because um, the question came up and it's kind of an interesting one, is to what extent do interest rates reflect inflation or not? Okay? So we know what inflation is. Inflation is the idea that, that my money is worth less, okay, at the grocery store than it was a year ago, okay? Now, inflation is governed by a percentage rate, okay? When we hear that the price of economic consumer prices go up 3%. Implicitly, that means my money is worth 3% less at the grocery store than it was before. The question is, to what extent is there a relationship between inflation rate and interest rates, okay? On one sense, you might say it's independent, okay? Because you might think it's independent. Because the, the bank rates are, are a function of what is it that people are willing to supply and demand for what people are willing to pay to borrow money. What happens at Park and Shop is a function of what, 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 what happens to the cost of the commodities and what people are willing to pay for those commodities, okay? But I want to argue that in the long run, there has to be a close, a somewhat of a connection, a fairly close connection between the interest rate and the inflation rate, okay? The first question would be, if the risk-free rate was too low relative to inflation, what would happen, okay? If, let's say, I could go and deposit my money in the bank and get a 1% return on my money, but consumer prices are increasing by 5%. What would happen? Would I want to put my money into the, into the bank? If there was a big match, if this was the in inflation, and this was the interest rate, if there was a big gap between them, would I want to put money in the bank? The answer should be no. Because the amount, of, the amount of interest that I'm getting, the value of my money coming out of the bank, is worth less in goods than it was when I put it in there. Does that make sense? So if the interest rate is high, if the inflation rate is high, and the interest rate is low, there will not be deposits in a bank. And if a bank wants its money, it's gonna, my money, it's going to have to raise its interest rates. Does that make sense? Okay? The classic example of this that I went through was I was, during the 1980s, Israel had a terrible inflation rate. And I spent the summer there once, okay, during this time. They had a rate of 400% a year at times. It was really, really bad. And the money was becoming less and less, you know, you know, what, what, you know inflation was very high and money's rate value deteriorated quickly. Now, that posed a big problem having to do with pay phones. Why is that a problem with pay phones? Does anyone remember what a pay phone is? I know you guys have cell phones now. Do people know what a pay phone is? Raise your hand if you know what a pay phone is. Some people don't, okay? You ever see, I want to say Superman or something like this in the movies? It used to be in the olden days, before they had cell phones. If you had to make a call, you went to a machine and you put a coin in and you got a call for three minutes. Does that sound like a reasonable thing? Talk to your parents. They don't know about pay phones. Okay? 
Now, what was the problem? If you have a pay phone where you have to put a coin in, okay, and money is becoming less valuable very quickly, you've got to send somebody in to fix the machine every once in a while, okay, to, so that it takes demands more and more money for each phone call. Does that make sense? Okay. Whenever you have a vending machine, if the money is worth less with time, you have to raise the prices in the vending machine. And to avoid that problem, what they did was instead of having you put coins into a, a, a pay phone, they had you put, buy special phone tokens that could only be used in pay phones. And each one of these phone tokens was worth one phone call. So if they wanted to later raise the price of a phone call, they just started charging more for these tokens. And they didn't have to fix the machines. Does that make sense? But what ended up happening? Because the inflation rate was high, and the interest rates that you could get on your savings wasn't, where would you put your savings? You would go buy lots and lots of phone tokens. Why is that? Because as the prices went up, the value of your phone tokens went up. You could use them to make a phone call at any time, right? Okay? So in principle, one of the, the weirdnesses when there was a, 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 a difference between the interest rate and the price of goods was that people put their goods into, um, what you call it, uh, into hard, you know, they put their money into goods. What about the other way? Suppose the risk-free rate was too high relative to inflation, okay? Suppose, let's say, I could go and get 10% on my money in the bank safely, and inflation was only 3%. What would it pay for me to do, okay? Suppose, let's say, that the, interest rate, infl the risk-free rate was very high relative to inflation. What should I do? I should take, well, I should save money. I would say a little differently. I should take everything that I own that I am not actively using at this instant and sell it. Why? Sell it and put the money in the bank. Why is that? Because the bank is going to earn money, more money, and then I can later, if I really want that thing again to use it, I can go buy it then. Okay? Does everybody see that? That if, let's say, there was a 0% inflation, my clothes for tomorrow, okay? I should sell my clothes, okay? And then know that I can buy them back at the same price that I had them now, right? And then when I need the clothes, I'll buy them. I'll take the money out of the bank then and buy it for that instant. Does everybody see that? And again, if people lived in this world, what would happen? Well, because everybody's trying to deposit at this risk-free rate, the party probably doesn't need to pay as much for it. You know, does not have, realizes it doesn't have to pay. It's getting more deposits than it needs. It will drop that rate, okay? And it will start to bring it closer to hand. Any questions? So the bottom line is that there is a connection between these two, although they're not quite proxy to each other because there are these transaction costs and difficulties that make it hard to really implement this kind of strategy to take advantages of differences, okay? But, but basically, they are going to be in, in, in sync. Any questions? Any questions at all about interest rates? Okay. What I'd now like to start talking about is, um, has to do with randomness and random walks, okay? Because this is going to be one of the um, first areas where, let's say, we'll start to see computer science-like ideas coming in. I'd like to think that everything that you found in the course so far is interesting. But if you had to say, what have we talked about here that has anything to do with computer science in any way? I don't think you could find anything, right? Okay? Random walks and, and, and Monte Carlo simulation at least start to get us into things that are somewhat computational, okay? And the reason, the sort of philosophical reason why they they work or where they come from has to do with the idea that financial prices, it is speculated, fluctuate randomly. Okay? Um, there was a guy um, back in 1900 who did his PhD thesis where he proposed this thing. 
No one paid much attention to it for like 60 years, okay? But in general, it's, it's become sort of an accepted fact governing a lot of what we, what we do in finance, is that prices for securities are, for, for certain things, are supposed to be basically unpredictable. Things being unpredictable is analogous to it being random, okay? J.P. Morgan was a famous banker. You probably heard of, you may have heard of the bank J.P. Morgan, but there was a time when he was, um, you know, the original J.P. Morgan was the most respected figure on Wall Street. And whenever anybody came up to him, they would always say to him, "What's going to happen in the stock market? Is the price is going to go up or down?" And he'd think about it and say, "Prices will." Everyone gets closer. Prices will fluctuate. Okay, <laughs> and that is probably the safe prediction that can be made. Okay. And it gets back to this idea of randomness. And the idea of randomness of financial things, time series, is somewhat appealing. When you take a look at a, rand at a price series, here is the price series for it looks like it was oil. Okay? If you look at that price series and you compare it to a up and down thing created by randomly taking upward steps and downward steps, if you use the right kind of random model of uh, uh, walk, it's not going to look that much different. That's one of the intuitions here, is that it's very easy for you to construct a random price series by starting at a point, picking a random number and going up or down depending upon what the value of the random number is. If so, you will end up with something that squiggles up and squiggles down. Now the question really is, do financial time series have properties that differ from these random walks? If not, these random walks become potentially good models for price series. Any questions? Okay. So why might we think of price series as being modeled by random movements? Okay. Part of us will instinctively rebel okay and say the price of Google stock is not random it depends upon how Google is going to do okay if Google is going to come out with a great product it will go up okay but one way to think about it is that that what's random is not necessarily the events that will happen there is going to be a course of history what is unpredictable is what that course of history actually is that's really sort of what the argument is. And if you believe in something called the efficient market hypothesis, which is one thing we'll talk about later when we talk about portfolios and, 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 and trading strategies and things like this, there is a serious scholarly thought that, that suggests that, 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 that all the information in a price, stock price, uh, about a company is currently reflected in its stock price. All the good things we know about what Google will do tomorrow in the future is already reflected by the fact that people think well of Google and have bought Google stock and are paying a high price for it now. Okay? And so if you believe that all the information that is currently out there and known about the company is already in its stock price, then what happens from here on out, the changes in the price, those have to reflect things that people don't know, okay, that are unknowable to us, and thus can in some sense be treated as being random events, okay, because we don't know of them and no, no one else in the world does, okay. That would be one argument for why random prices might be a meaningful model. Another argument, if you don't believe that, would have to do with the fact that many price changes are due to supply and demand things, okay? You want to buy a boat, okay? You have fortunate to have a lot of Google stock now, right? And you're just itching to buy a boat. When you sell the boat, what's going to happen, okay? When you sell the, the Google stock, what's going to happen? the price should go down because suddenly there is a, a large supply a boat's worth of Google stock out there that people are trying to sell 
unless there is an increase in the demand for Google. Because there is now an increase in supply, we would expect the price to go down, right? But your desire to buy a boat is a random thing that is in, unconnected to the fate of Google, right? And for every boat that you want to buy, okay, there is somebody else who just inherited, you know, cash and wants to sort of buy something. So as long as there's, who has suddenly woken up with a dream that Google is going to go up and suddenly need to buy a large stock of it. So a lot of the price changes are due to temporary imbalances between supply and demand. And these can be modeled as random fluctuations. So a random model is not a ridiculous model for a lot of price changes, okay? And coming to accept that is an important part of understanding what we're going to do in here, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Um, again, the argument here is why is it that we can believe that, the, that that movements were random? Because if they were not random, the opposite of random is predictable, right? And if we could predict that the next price movement for Google is going to be that it goes up, then frankly people would have already bought the Google stock. And because of supply and demand, it would have already gone up, right? So this is sort of the argument that, that these things should be random. Okay, with any model, things are not completely true. But recognize that there's a certain intellectual satisfaction about this. Okay? If we believe that everyone has the same information about these things, and if something was predictable, there were enough people out there trying to predict it, that when they predicted that the price was going to go up, they bought it. That would have increased the demand, that would have raised the price, and this would have removed the predictability. Okay? Any questions? So what's left when you remove the predictability? What's left is randomness. Any questions about that? Okay? So that's sort of the idea. But it leaves us in a world where we can now start to understand something about what will happen with prices by considering the properties of random walks. Okay? If we believe that a stock price is a random walk, we could kind of picture the future of the world as having, you know, if we think about what's going to happen in the future, there can be lots and lots of different possible futures that may play out. In each one of them, the price of Google is going to go through a different series of, of events. What we can do is, by constructing random walks designed to model stock prices, okay, in an intelligent way, okay, we can now look at what is the distribution of these random walks. Here we see, okay, um, eight different random walks generated by a particular price model, okay? Could it, do any of those look weird to the extent that they couldn't correspond to a price of something? If you saw any one of those eight things in the newspaper, and it told you that's what Hang Seng Bank did over the last year, okay? It would have been equally believable, okay? But what we can try to take a look at then, by re using sort of so-called Monte Carlo methods, okay, are construct large numbers of random walks. Look at the statistical distribution of where the prices end up. And then, based on that, use that for sort of pricing things like options. Okay? What would we want to know? When we had a call option, what would I really want to know if I wanted to have a call option? Okay? Here I have a call option that's going to uh, expand the stock that's going to pay off like this, so let's say like this. And I want to know the value of it. What I really, really, really want to know, in order to know the value of this option, I claim, is for every possible price, what is the probability that the stock will take on that price? Does everybody see that? 
the profit I make at the point is going to be the difference between, okay, the, uh, you know, basically the strike price and the spot price, okay? If I know what the probability is of, 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 of it hitting that, that price for every possible spot price, I can integrate over that and figure out the exact value of the option. Does that make sense? If I knew the probability, the, the, the price distribution, here is a probability, if I, if, I, if I could draw a probability distribution, where here is the price and here is the probability. If I knew this, I could, and I knew that this was the right probability distribution for prices. In the future, I could accurately price what the option is worth. Is that clear? Because the, what it's worth is a function of, for, of the price and the, times the probability that I reach that price. Okay? How might I use these random walks to make a prediction about what the probability of the price, the, the price distribution is. If I have designed these walks in a way that they accurately reflect the likely, the, the, the possible samplings of the movements of this particular stock, okay? What I could do is run a billion, a million, let's say a million random walks and look to see where do they end up. When I look at what, I will get a probability distribution here. It looks like here, again, this is too small a number to be sure, but under this particular model, it looked like there was a higher probability of ending up here than there. If I ran a million of these walks, I could figure out what was the probability distribution, simply by observing at the end what was there. Okay? And if this model was meaningful, that would give me enough money, enough information to accurately price the option. Any questions about that? Do people see that if I could come up with a good random walk model for this, I can price the option? You may say, well, but this doesn't seem like it's going to be a good model. And that's maybe a philosophical thing. But this does give us an approach to think about trying to price these things. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about this strategy here? So, um, what kind of random walks might we think about? The simplest random walk, okay, might be one where at each step on the model, we move either one unit up or one unit down according to some probability. Okay? So let's say in this particular random walk model, okay, um, we would move up one unit with a probability of P and down with a probability of 1 minus P. Okay? Once we define a model like that, okay, we can start to think about the distribution of these things. What do we know if we think about random walks like this, where you're allowed to take at each step a walk, a step up or down? Okay? What is the probability after, let's say, uh, a certain number of steps? Okay? After n steps, what is the probability we're at a particular height? If we think about it, every if we move up every time we flip a coin, every time we, our coin says heads, and down every time it says tails, a particular height at a particular time is going to reflect what? I will claim that we got a certain amount more heads than tails. Is that right? And we could do this by simulation. Okay? Or we could compute the probability of ending up at a particular height by combinatorics. 
What is the probability that we will end up with h heads and n minus h tails if we flip a coin n times? Does anyone remember that? You're pointing to my screen formula, right? What is the probability that we do that? The probability is we have a set of n coins. If we're going to get h of them heads, we can choose h of the numbers from 1 to n to be where the heads are going to be. For each of those, the likelihood we got a head then was a p, was a was p. The likelihood we got a tail was 1 minus p. This formula gives us the probability of what we are doing. Okay? So what's interesting here, again, I'll, I'll, I'm going to break here. We should get the idea that random walks does not mean it's not predictable. Random walks does not mean it's all simulation. It means that, it's a, that, that once we have a model of what's going to happen, we can analyze it either with simulation or with closed form results to figure out what it's going to do. Okay, and if our model accurately reflects the underlying situation, this gives us a way to think about pricing options. Any questions? Okay, next class we will resume and talk more deeply about random walks and Monte Carlo methods and how they work. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>